your cheating heart would have fit pretty well. We are going to be in the, we're going to begin in Proverbs chapter 7 tonight. We're actually going to uh, look at Proverbs chapter 7 and a little bit of Proverbs chapter 8 as well. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, it, it, growing up in Sonora, I remember when I started high school, Sonora only had one stoplight. It was on the main drag. By the time I graduated high school, we had two stoplights in the town. We were becoming a big city by then. But one of the what we kids did when we were in high school after we got our driver's license is we would drive up and down that, that main street all night long. Some of you are shaking your heads. You know what I'm talking about. And of course, this is back when when gas was a little cheaper than it is today, which is good because my pickup, I think, got nine miles to the gallon. But, but that's what we do. We drive up and down the street. But, but since I didn't always have a lot of, of money for gas, I would drive the 15 miles into town, and I would make one pass, and then I would back in to the grocery store and watch everybody else drive back and forth. I figured that way, if they wanted to hang out with me, they knew where I was. And I didn't have to burn all my gas. Every now and then I'd get in with somebody else and just drive up and down. Well, one night I'm parked there and somebody else stops and, and we're visiting and hanging out. And then some other kids pull in. And before long, the whole parking lot is filled with teenagers. And after an hour or so, uh, it's also filled with police cars. And uh, there were some things going on in that parking lot that shouldn't have been. And so when I got home that night, Daddy, of course, already knew about it. And he said, what happened at, at the grocery store tonight? I said, Dad, I was just sitting there. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. I mean, I'm just sitting there, and all of a sudden, everybody else showed up. And he said, well, why were you sitting there? And I said, well, just looking for something to do. I said, Dad, you did it when you were in high school. And he said, I thought. And I know why you were there. And I said, well, but Dad, I really didn't, didn't cause any, any of the trouble. It just kind of came, you know? <laughs> Have you ever felt like that? Like you don't go really looking for trouble, but you find yourself in a place where trouble is real close by and inconvenient for you? Yeah. Well, the writer of Proverbs understands that. And he writes this to young men to help them not put themselves in that predicament. Now, when the writer of Proverbs tells these stories, he uses uh, pictures, and he tells the story in a picture form so that we can see how foolish things really are. But also, uh, he, he tells the story in such a way that, that like this morning in our, in our class in Revelation, we talked about the fact that when, he talk, when they talk about adultery and adulteresses in the Bible, they may not necessarily be talking literally about adulteresses. And so as we go through Proverbs chapter 7 tonight, I want you to keep in mind that, that this story picture that he's telling here affect, it has to do with things that could affect all of our lives. Because no matter how old we are, no matter how faithful we are, we can still put ourselves in places where trouble is real close by. And it's very easy to just give in and go along with something that we shouldn't. Proverbs chapter 7, he begins very much like uh, every other sermon or every other lesson uh, in Proverbs. He says, my son, keep my words and store them and store up my commandments within you. My commands... And keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on a tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call understanding your kinsmen. They will keep you from the adulteress, from the wayward wife and her seductive words. And then he <coughs> says, there's two things that he emphasizes. First of all, he says, this is to my son. Now, Probably the writer wasn't writing specifically to his own son, but he had that kind of relationship where he cared enough about these young men that he could say to them, My son, I write these to you. Listen to my words. You get that? Pretty good, wasn't it? All right, cool. But the other thing is, he said, I want you to take 
this wisdom that I'm going to impart on you and, and make it a part of your family. Protect it like you would your sister. Call it your, your kinsman. Yes, absolutely. And, and so make this a part of, of your life because if you hold on to the things I'm going to teach you, they're going to protect you from that adulteress, that wayward woman who, he says, comes at you with seductive words. And there's a lot of seduction that goes on here. Now in verse 6, he begins the story picture and he says, At the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice. Now I want you to keep in mind, where is he? In his house, looking out the window through the lattice. Okay? He's in a place where he is removed from what's about to take place. And there's some wisdom in there. We'll get into that in a little bit. So he is in his house, in the window of his house, looking out through the lattice, and he saw among the simple. I noticed among the young men, and if you don't know anything about parallelism, what he's just said is young men are simple. I noticed among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who lacked judgment. Now this is the young man who doesn't hold on to wisdom, who doesn't hold on to the teachings, and he doesn't have the judgment. He is going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house at twilight as the day is fading and the dark of night setting. Now that's a very descriptive picture there. He's walking along the street, but he's not just ambly walking along. He's actually walking in the direction of her house. Getting a little closer to her house. Her corner. And it's getting dark. You see, this young man puts himself in a place and a time where temptation is going to be the strongest. And then, surprise, surprise, out came a woman to meet him, as if he didn't know there might be a chance that a woman might come out to meet him. But she comes out dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. She's loud and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now she's in the street. Now in the streets. Now in the squares. In every corner she lurks. In other words, the adulteress is everywhere. You don't have to go specifically to her. You just get close enough to her and the seductive adulteress will come out and seek you. And she took hold of him and she kissed him. Now that won't get a young man's attention. I don't know what will. And with a brazen face, she said, and I want us to look at the things that she says and how she is so seductive to this young man. I have fellowship offerings at home. Today I have fulfilled my vows. Now that's religious talk. So she comes out, she approaches him and she talks as if she's, she's got some religion. Well that impresses the young man. He must be safe since she has some religion even though she just laid a big smacker on his face. And so I came out to meet you. I have looked for you and I have found you. Oh, there is nothing that will attract a young man and for a woman to say, I've been looking for someone just like you my whole life. And you're finally here. It makes him feel special. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deep of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves in love. All of this language about the bed and the smells and the perfumes and, and the love. Seduction. Entrapment. And then to top it all off, she says, my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He took his purse, filled it with money, and will not be home till full moon. Nobody's going to know. We can do this, and we can get away with it. You notice how she seduces him and allures him? 
with persuasive words. She led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. Now, from the, the literal adulterous perspective, most of us understand how bad this can be. But I want us to keep in mind that a lot of times adultery is talking about uh, things other than literal adultery. The ways of the world that slowly seduce us. The ways of the world that, that have a hint of religion in them. The ways of the world that make us feel special. You can have it your way. You deserve this. The, the ways of the world that say, come on in, we'll, we'll, this will feel good. This will satisfy a longing that you've been having for a long time. And not only that, but, but nobody really has to know. I mean, your church folks, they're not going to know what you did on Thursday morning. It's okay. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. And again, here's another great picture story. All at once, he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter. Like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces its liver. Like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. Every one of these pictures is a picture of something about to die. The ox going to slaughter. The deer caught in the noose until the arrow pierces its liver. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever done much hunting, but a liver shot is a very lethal shot. Bird darting into a snare, not little knowing that it will cost him his life. Now then, my son, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. For many, many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave leading down to the chambers of death. You see, to leave... Your love to sleep with another man's wife, no matter how alluring she may be, will lead to death. As we saw in, in our Revelation class this morning, to, to leave your husband, God the Father, to go out and join with another leads to death. But what was interesting is as I was reading through chapter 7, I finished chapter 7 and just started reading right into chapter 8 and noticed that there's a, almost a lot of reversal between chapter 7 and chapter 8. Chapter 7 is about this, this picture of about the, the young boy who is led astray and seduced. Chapter 8 is almost uh, the way to live to make sure that you don't get that way. Chapter 8 begins, does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? You see, wisdom is trying to get your attention too. Interesting thing though is this adulteress reaches out, grabs a guy, and lays a big kiss on his face. Wisdom calls. Wisdom is not going to be forceful. Wisdom is not going to be that brazen. Wisdom is something that you have to listen to and pursue. On the heights... Along the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gates leading into the city, at the entrance, she cries aloud. Now, there we notice that just like the woman is everywhere, so is wisdom. But rather than being the aggressor, wisdom is there calling. Listen to me. To you, O oh men, verse 4, I call out, I raise my voice to all mankind. Back in chapter 7, verse 7, he said, I saw a simple, I noticed among the young men a man who lacked judgment. That's because he didn't heed this call of wisdom. Verse 5, you are simple. You who are simple gain prudence. You see, it's something that you can get. You're not just stuck there without any, oper any options. You who are simple gain prudence. You who are foolish gain understanding. In verse 6, listen, for I have worthy things to speak, to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true, and my lips detest wickedness. Now that's in contrast 
to the woman in, her, in chapter 7 who plants a seductive kiss and then fills the room with lies and deception and seduction. But wisdom speaks truth. In verse 8, all the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are faultless to those who have knowledge. Choose by instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell together with, with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have understanding and power. By me kings reign and rulers make laws that are just. By me princes govern and all nobles who rule on earth. I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. Turn back again to chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a, a youth who lacked judgment. He was going down to the street corner, near her corner, walking along the direction of her house. He was putting himself in the wrong place, looking for love in all the wrong places. And that would have been a great song for tonight's lesson, wouldn't it? Looking for love in all the wrong places. But in chapter 8, verse 17, this is true love. I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold, yet I, what I yield surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, bestowing wealth on those who love me and making their treasures full. Flip back over to chapter 7, beginning in verse 21. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth <coughs> talk. All at once he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into the noose till the arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. So you have this one picture of the adulteress who leads down, down, down to death. And then here you have this picture of walking in the way of righteousness along the path of justice, bestowing wealth on those who love me and making their treasures full. It's walking in the opposite directions. Verse 22, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work before his deeds of old. I was appointed from eternity, from the beginning before the world began. When there were no oceans, I was given birth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled into place, before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the earth and its fields or any of the dust of the earth, of the world, I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep. When he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep. When he gave the sea its boundary so the waters would not overstep his command. And when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was the craftsman at his side. I was filled with delight day after day rejoicing always in his presence. Rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. Wisdom is saying here that the adulteress and the pleasures from that are temporary and fleeting, not only leading to destruction, but wisdom is an eternal thing. The adulteress leads away from God. Wisdom has always been with God. And so in verse 32, Now then listen, my sons, to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Do not ignore it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. Now I want us to think back. In chapter 7, where is the man 
who tells the story about seeing the young man being led astray. In his house. In his house. Verse 34, chapter 8. Blessed is the man who listens to me watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. You see, there is safety when you remain in the household of wisdom. Because that keeps you from wandering out into a place where temptation may even be close by. For whoever finds me, verse 35, for whoever finds me finds life. And whoever finds the adulteress is led where? Death. To death. Whoever finds me finds life and receives favor from the Lord, but whoever fails to find me harms himself, and all who hate me love death. You see, what these psalms or proverbs are saying is that our pursuit, the place where we reside, the things that we must be surrounded by are wisdom. We dwell in the house of wisdom. Wisdom is our sister. Wisdom is our kinsman. Wis wisdom and understanding and discernment are the things that are, are more precious to us than anything else. And those are the things that will protect us from being led astray by whatever adulteress approaches us. The, the problem is sometimes we get like these foolish young men, the simple, who lack judgment, and we put ourselves in places where, where we really shouldn't be. Listening to things we shouldn't really listen to. Watching things we shouldn't really watch. Spending time with people maybe sometimes we shouldn't really spend time with. And we need to gain wisdom. To be able to say, no, that's, that's not where someone who belongs to God would be. Not, not even getting close to that. Because that's just not where I belong. And so we're going to continue going through the Proverbs because, and, and I know it, it begins to sound a little redundant because he says the same thing over and over again. But let me ask you this. Do, do you think when uh, I finally got to where I could sit down again after my episode at the, at the parking lot at the grocery store and my dad finding out that the police were there, do you think that was the only time he ever told me not to be hanging out there again? No. And God doesn't tell us just once to pursue wisdom and stay away from the adulterers. He tells us that over and over and over and over again. Why? Because we need it. Let's pray. Our Father... We pray that you will grant us, that you will give us this wisdom, that you will open our minds to hear your words, to hear and understand your words, and that we'll take them to heart, Father, not just hear them and turn around and walk out like a man who looked in a mirror and immediately forgot what he looked like, but help us, Father, to take these words and put them into practice and make them a part of who we are. That we will begin to notice the seducing language of our culture and the world around us. We'll begin to understand, Father, uh, that we are being led into temptation. And we'll start recognizing when we are walking down the path in the wrong way towards something that we know we really shouldn't be walking toward. We pray that this wisdom then, our kinsmen, will pull us back. Because, Father, what we want more than anything is to be just like your son and to live that way so that the people around us, Father, can, can see a glimpse of your kingdom on this earth. And that's why you called us to be your people, your priests. So I pray, Father, that you will create within all of us that, that clean heart that we talked about this morning where we truly seek you and seek the wisdom that you have for us. And, Father, we lift all this to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If there's anything you need from us tonight, any, any way you need to respond at all, we're going to uh, have a time of invitation. We'll stand and sing this song. And if you have some needs, let those be known at this time.